Uh, well, the light is into my eyes. Uh, well, hi everybody, my name is Farnos and as Stephen was saying, I've got 60 slides. Some people in the audience have told me already that uh, people may fall asleep, so I will try my best. Um, but I cannot promise. Okay, so I'm going to talk about innovating aging and specifically what I'm going to talk about is actually I've got that title from a book which I'm going to show you later, which is Design Meets Aging. And the word there is design. And well, so maybe by design, what maybe sometimes come to your mind is this type of design and this type of designer. So maybe a fabulous Karim Rashid or who's the, who's the next one, you know? Yes, okay. Well, I, I really appreciate these guys, but I have a little bit of a problem with this design approach, which perhaps is, uh, this, this, this is going to help me explain what sort of problem I have. Who do you think these three guys are? Any ideas, any guesses? Anything? If I give you a clue, the one in the middle is a designer, what do you think the one on the left and right are? Artist and? No? No? Okay, yes. Okay, so artist and engineer. And the fact is that there is a little bit of a difference between these three types. And I see myself as a designer where I see a little bit of difference if I want to say what the difference is. The artist approaches everything, the task, in a kind of subjective matter while an engineer approaches it in an objective matter, a designer has to have a kind of balance of both. Um, also, an artist is self-expressive, while an engineer is very much oriented in terms of task-oriented. A, a designer is supposed to be user-oriented. And that's where I really see the difference, I mean, um, of what I'm trying to do, um, compared to guys like... Um, Karim Rashid, for example. So, what I do is inclusive design, and what inclusive design is about is uh, design of mainstream products, services, and environments that are useful and usable. I know it's boring to some most of you because you know about it, uh, by as many people as possible without the need for adaptation. And this, to me, is a horrible example of an assistive product. So, this to me is a major design failure. Because, I mean, okay, I'm not going to say why, but I, I really hate looking at this. And I have got a very boring example of inclusive design, which all of you know about, and that's um, the Augsburg Good Grips. But unfortunately, maybe we do not have so many brilliant other examples I could show you. So, um, I am from the Inclusive Design Research Group at Brunel, and what we try to do is, I mean, saying engaging people with inclusive design, informing and impacting the wider society. So, the three type of things that we do, first of all, we um, provide specific knowledge about inclusive design. We try to provide understanding of a wider range of users and their, their needs. And we also try to provide methods and tools specifically for designers to work more e effectively in the field of inclusive design. So we really approach inclusive design from two different and key perspectives. One of them is the end user and the other one is a designer. Uh, I would like to go through both of them very quickly. Uh, the two dimensions, these are the kind of stereotypical dimensions to inclusivity, are the aging and disability, but these are the only two of them and there are more dimensions to it. So talking about end user, a couple of projects that we have done regarding that, perhaps not the most uh, prestigious product, but this is a commode. And this has been one of the most interesting projects I've been involved with. This was a project we worked uh, uh, on with Design Council, and it was about redesigning commodes in order to address what they call HCAIs, or healthcare associated infections. Um, so we worked with a team of designers and a manufacturer, and we tried to bring some insights into the problem. So we went out there, observed nurses, and talked to the patients in terms of the, this, this is actually the sluice room. And this, uh, the, what you see over there is an example of the existing commode they had. So through going through a number of scenarios and trying to create more insight into what the problem is, we got 
to this commode, which is supposed to be very easy to clean for the nurses as one type of the end user, but also comfortable for the patients. The other project, um, not necessarily product, but again inclusive, is the problem that currently um, TFL are having with uh, buses. Buses prove to be the most uh, accessible sort of transport in London, and they will be in the future as well. Um, so. TFL and um, the local council approached us with the idea of um, currently the, uh, the specialized services are being oversubscribed. So they wanted to bring back the diversity to public buses. And by diversity, they meant specifically people with disabilities and aging population. So in order to work on the project, first we defined what we meant by um, mobility challenged people. We identified them into different groups and um, we started looking at all stages of a bus journey and trying to identify what the problems there are. Um, we worked with a very diverse group of people, bus um, users and bus non-users, as well as different stakeholders that we had. We sat on a wheelchair. This was one of the most exciting parts of the project for me. I had never sat on a wheelchair before. And the, and the kind of attitude that I had from the bus drivers to me, they wouldn't be talking to me, but they would be talking to the, one who, the person who was accompanying me. Where is she getting off? Rather than asking me, where are you getting off? Which was quite interesting. So um, we came up with a number of problems in terms of the physical issues, but what sound to be really, really interesting out of coming, out of working with um, different groups of people was what we call the psychosocial problems or the psychosocial issues. So as you see here, maybe you cannot see it, but what the, um, the old lady has written is everybody thinks of one another. This was the idea of what they wanted to see on a bus. So the issues that we came up with was physical, psychosocial, and operational issues. But the two ones at the bottom seem to be the most important ones. So the, the idea was that perhaps we need a sort of mentality shift when you're talking about public bus transport. So moving from physical accessibility necessarily and only thinking about that to what we call the kind of psychosocial inclusion which is a little bit more difficult to address. Okay, so moving to the designer. Well, so in the absence of detailed information we all work from assumptions. We tend to design for ourselves, not for others. Now up to that next one which says the average UK designer is male, white, and 30 years old. So this is really the issue we're struggling with in terms of is there enough information about uh, aging or disability for designers? And how would you make that accessible to them? So first of all, it's a matter of what kind of data would you collect? Is it just only the physiological or is it also, as someone was already saying, emotional data as well? And how would you communicate it to designers so that they can feel both um, informed and inspired? So this is an example of um, a simulation kit uh, which one of our, actually our students is using in order to try opening up a packaging. So this is one of the things that we try to use in terms of letting both um, student designers and also perhaps professional designers get an insight. This is an example of a student project which is an inclusive um, pill dispenser. So again, one student, this, is, this, has, this has not gone to the market, but one student trying to gain understanding of inclusive design and actually uh, coming up with a usable product. So within our approach to um, inclusion, we look at two dimensions. I've been telling you a little bit about aging. Um, I would like to very quickly move to disability because I think there might be some lessons for us in terms of looking at how disability community have been able to do it and maybe there are some lessons for the aging um, community as well. So this is a definition of um, disability which I very much like. A complex interaction between a person's body and environment and society. This is how it's defined by WHO and so as it says, people therefore are disabled by society they live in, not necessarily and directly by impairment that they have. And I think this very much changes our approach and understanding in terms of um, disability. So this is where I 
kind of stole the title of my talk from. This is an excellent book which somehow explores the tension between the two, actually the writer calls it a healthy tension between the two fields of disability and design and whether what we could take out of it. So I think it's a really good book for all of us perhaps read, if, to read if you want to see if there's anything we can do in terms of um, aging as well. And do you know who this slide is? Amy Mullins? Uh, well, um, again, this is trying, I mean, she's an athlete, she's um, a sport person, she's a, a fashion uh, person as well. And these are, she has got 10 different pairs of legs. And she says that, okay, the fact is that actually, compared to you guys who might have only one pair of legs, not might, but do, uh, most of us, I, I've got something extra. So it's really about the idea of not only you replicate normality, you also try to enhance capability. And I think this, again, creates a kind of different approach towards perhaps disability and then maybe aging. So I think, as Stephen was already saying, it's a matter of a new language. And when you say design is aging, this is how designers think about a person they're designing for most of the time. I'm talking about the stereotypes here. So a person who's perfect in their body and mind but maybe the picture is something like this. And this is, I, I tried to find an older person's picture, but this was as old as I could get. But perhaps the reality is something like this. So, and this is the kind of image of um, aging that you would get, you know, in the media and all that. So, the new language, could it be a language of innovation? And I'm fin finishing here, how? Okay, good. So, this is how Design Council try to sell the idea of a designer to everybody, saying that designers have got four um, specific skills that all together makes them a designer. They're good at understanding users, they're good at collaboration, they're good at visualization and prototyping. Do we think that there is something designers could do with, the, with this mixture of skills that they've got in order to promote something to the field of aging? So thinking big. So. Perhaps all of us agree that we need a new language, but what that new language is going to be. Um, this is challenging times, NHS cuts and all things like that. Can we actually turn it around and make it like a good time for innovation? Um, designers, I mean, I was educated as an industrial designer, and I had no idea of social design or social innovation. But we now very much understand that designers are not necessarily designing products that could be aimed at aging. Designers are in the social innovation camp as well. Um, and the other thing which I think is quite important is design and aging. Could we create a kind of convergent model of communication between the two fields? There is a lot of information in the field of um, geriatrics and gerontology, but it's not that well communicated to designers. So perhaps there is a gap that could be addressed. So. We are the Inclusive Design Research Group and um, we have also got an inclusive special interest group which is open to everybody and it's kind of international group and we want to facilitate more research about inclusive design and people talking and working together. So we would be very happy to hear from you. I hope no one is, has fallen asleep already. So thank you.